<laughs> hey everybody! Hey, it's Cece or Cindy, however you know me. And we are here today as our weekly Song of Songs teaching. Today we're going to start with session 11. And as you know, I'm teaching from Mike Bickle's notes back from the uh, 90s on the Song of Solomon and each one of his chapters is at least two hours worth of teaching so lately I've had to cut it down in half. I've been through it four or five times and I like you say yeah I'm gonna go home and read over those notes mm -mm, mm -mm. when hardly ever happens so I figure the best thing to do is just take our time. We're gonna go through it together and uh, really get the meat out of the Word of God. So let's start with prayer. Father, I just, I just give myself to you, and I thank you, Lord, that you are always with us, that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, that we might know what is the hope of your calling and your riches and your inheritance in the saints. We ask you, Lord, now for the anointing, not only for teaching for me, but for receiving for all of us, that we may eat the meat of your word, that it may become part of us, Lord, as we eat the scroll, that we may be transformed from darkness into light and enter into mature bridal partnership with you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Now, well, let's see. Hold on. Let me get my little Bible over here. We've been starting every session reading out of the message, and I don't want to miss one because it's fun just to see what it's like. This one is chapter 4, verse 1, and I guess I'll just read through about verse 8 just so we can get an understanding. Okay. Now this is Jesus, or Solomon, who is speaking. You're so beautiful, my darling, so beautiful, and your dove's eyes are veiled by your hair as it flows and shimmers like a flock of goats in the distance, streaming down a hillside in the sunshine. Your smile is generous and full, expressive and strong and clean. Your lips are jewel red, your mouth elegant and inviting, your veiled cheeks soft and radiant. The smooth line of your neck commands notice. All heads turn in awe and admiration, and your breasts are like fawns, twins of a gazelle, grazing among the first spring flowers. The sweet, fragrant curves of your body, the soft, spice contours of your flesh, invite me, and I come, I stay, until the dawn breathes its light and the night slips away. You are beautiful from head to toe, my dear love. Beautiful beyond compare. Absolutely flawless. <laughs> and that once again is from the message. But I am teaching from the New King James Version, which is actually my favorite. So it actually starts with, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. I think that one of the things this beautiful message Bible, it brings to us is beautiful love poetry. It's beautiful. Who wouldn't want a man, a king, to speak that over your life? And I think that um, perhaps we still have a bit of prudishness uh, left over from the Victorian era. That we hear these things in the church and we're like, oh, don't mention that word in church. You know, Maybe this is why a lot of pastors don't preach on the Song of Solomon. They get to this point and they can't look at great grandma over there on the front row and say the word breast. It's like, I can't do it. <laughs> but Jesus does it. He does it. And so I think the word of God is complete and entire. And isn't he the God of love? So we need to understand, though, that we're looking at this as an allegory. And a lot of men read this and like, ooh, ooh, Song of Solomon, you know, but they're really in the flesh when they say it like that. They need to understand this is an allegory and each word is beautiful. Now, we're going to delve into it in depth in a little while, but right now I'm just going to go real quick over these eight character traits 
that Jesus describes because he's the one talking in these first eight verses of chapter four. And by the way, this is a turning point chapter. This is right in the middle. Chapter four is the middle of the song. It's uh, there's eight chapters. And this is where she gets her turning point and he finally breaks the silence. So uh-huh. these are, I know, he breaks the silence. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, all right, there's eight things that I'm going to just hit real quickly. And later we'll go into them in detail. But he says, she has, number one, dove's eyes. It speaks of the eyes of faith in Revelation. Two, hair like a goat. Well, you know, in our society, <laughs> hair like a goat is like stiff and gray and like, ugh. But to him, it meant she was dedicated to God and spiritual covering and submission. Now, it sounds strange. Later, I'll explain how he, you know, we get that out of those words. Number three, the teeth. Her teeth are shorn like sheep. You know, teeth, I just love nice, clean teeth. Well, what it really means is chewing of the food of long, loving meditation on the meat of the Word of God. She could eat the meat. She wasn't a babe in Christ at this point. Uh, Number four, her lips were like scarlet. Verbal communication in her life was influenced by the blood of Jesus, the redemption of Christ. Five, the kisses of the mouth means intimacy with God. Six, veiled temples or cheeks are our emotions and they're impacted by the grace of God. Miss Hope's come today. You like that part. And the neck, like David's tower, means the free will. She had a free will that was submitted to God. And eight, her breast, like fawns, the power to edify and nurture others. Miss Hope. Shh, shh. All right. <laughs> so, that's extremely quick. I realize that. But what I want to do now is to look at a little bit of the overview. We're going to overview the Song of Solomon. And... What we have is number one in verses four, five, one through five is she is affirmed. Oh my gosh. She's now at this season in her life is God's plan and she realizes I'm God's plan. I'm God's gift to Jesus. I am Jesus's inheritance. It took her half her life or four chapters in this case to get to that point. She realizes it's not about her. It's about God and that she's his inheritance. She's finally beginning to capture the idea of that, you know, it's not about her, it's about him, that he is her inheritance, but it's more that she's his inheritance. And she wants to love him like he loves her. That's what she wants more than anything, to love him like he loves her. And that she's finally realized that... um, This is the way that she becomes the father's gift to the son, is by loving him like he loves her. So in verse 1, he's affirming her. He says, you know, oh, my love, my fair one. He breaks the silence. And then later, at number 2, he says, um, she says, she responds with a commitment to total obedience. That's verse 6. We're going to get to that probably next week. But in verse 6, let's just see real quick. She says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. In other words, she's saying, I'm going the whole distance, Lord. I'm all yours. I'm going every bit. And then he affirms her again in verse 9. And then in verse 16, she prays to Jesus to perfect her faith. And by chapter 5, he's answering her prayer. Now, that's just a broad summary of where we're getting ready to head. I think before we go into these eight attributes, though, I think it's really important for us to look at the cherishing heart of Jesus, which will be what we're talking about today. Jesus cherishes us. He cherishes us. And we live in a world of negativity. We have, my, I do, negative voices, condemnation, depression, discouragement. I'm never good enough. I'm not going to be enough. It, it's like the devil is sitting on your shoulder speaking to you. And he probably is the author of all this condemnation continually. But we also have brokenness and weakness in our lives. that We constantly fight that inside of us. And by now, the Shulamite has learned to ignore those voices in her head. 
And the way she has done this is by grabbing hold of the cherishing heart of Jesus, that he mm. cherishes her, that she is without spot or wrinkle. Let's look in Ephesians 5. This is where 27 and 29, most people use this to talk about um, men and women being married. Paul was teaching about husbands, but he was also, and maybe more importantly, teaching us about how God sees us. Paul said that God, that he might present her a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives, nourishes and cherishing her, just as the Lord does the church. Nourishing and cherishing, just as the Lord does the church. So this is a great passage to where we learn that God is a nourisher. He's a cherisher. And often those are feminine attributes that we think of, nourishing and cherishing. But no, this is God, Father God, strong, bold Jesus. You know, I love to think of it as the strong, masculine hand with this beautiful red rose just delicately held by God. That's who we are. We're the rose. He has all the strength that all existence has ever had, but yet he holds us, cherishing us gently and nourishing us. Now, there are many translations, and the NIV is one of them, and it actually talks about um, the church will be glorious and radiant. The word radiant, um, that we are radiant and glorious with the love of God. And so this joy and this love that God gives us, this is what makes us radiant. If, you know, when someone's in love, they just radiate. When you've been in worship and you have just felt the love of God for who you are, wherever you are, and all your weaknesses, and you feel loved, you shine. There's no greater feeling in the world than to have someone love you even when you're unlovable. That is what God does for us. He loves weak and broken people, and we forget that. We, we get lost in religion many times that, you know, if you're not perfect, you're not good enough, God won't love you. That's not our God at all. He loves us. We, Holy Spirit reveals to us that uh, Jesus has a cherishing ministry. You know, um, in this generation in which Jesus is revealed as the heavenly bridegroom, this message is most important. He is in the end times, in the book of Revelation, and now, currently, for the last 20 years, is revealing himself as bridegroom king. Many of us relate to him as father, brother, you know, even some people relate to him as mother, which is really the nurturing quality of God. But he's revealing himself as bridegroom. Why is he doing that? Well, because he wants to cherish us. He knows that in the last days, the sexual immorality that is poured out on the earth, the false intimacy of all sorts of things which draw men and women into the deep darkness of despair, the opposite of that is true intimacy in Christ. It's the bridegroom message that heals us, that heals our society, that causes us to be washed with the water of the word. In the last days, it's the lover of God that has the strength. And our strength comes from knowing we're cherished even when we're imperfect people. And I'll say this again, yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Don't forget that. And as we grow in maturity in the body of Christ, this is something we often forget because we so easily as humans get into the rules and rituals of do's and don'ts. Yeah, it's really important not to have sex outside of marriage, okay, just as one thing because the Bible says fornication is wrong. But we are all weak and broken people and that does not mean that you can't be a Christian struggling with a sin. It means you need to run to God to get delivered from your sin and to be healed so that you're free to live in holiness. And it is a freedom to not have that temptation. It's a freedom to never feel the temptation. And that is only found in Christ. Amen. Only in Him. He really will. I'm a living testimony to that. I've been single for I don't even know how many years now. And I don't even have the sexual temptation anymore. I really don't. I, it's, it's not that I'm shut down, but
But God has given me a grace mm -hmm. to where I'm not tempted in that area. God forbid, Lord, please keep the grace since I'm declaring this publicly. The enemy won't come after me. But I don't even have a problem with it. You know, it's not something I struggle with all the time. I'm happy who I am and I'm happy in Christ and, and I'm completely fulfilled. And if I ever got married again, I'm sure God would, you know, help me in that area it would change who i am but for now he's given me a supernatural grace and favor to not really have that problem and i am it's not just women men can feel this too it is a great holy freedom to never have to worry with it and it is a feeling loved and being loved back that causes us to have that radiance as i said the primary method, this is the absolute number one way that God changes his weak and sin-filled bride is to nourish us and to cherish us. He's not a God with a stick that's going to beat you over the head. That, that just makes children run from their father. If, you know, yeah, maybe discipline is important, and it is. God disciplines us. But as we learned in the previous chapters, he first causes us to be so in love with him that when we disobey him, he withdraws his presence. And that is the discipline. We cannot live without him. And then when his presence comes back to affirm us because we've been faithful even when we couldn't feel it, that's where we are right here in this chapter. He's nourished such a love for him in her that she can have no other. She cares for nothing else. You know, He feeds her. He nourishes her. He cares for her. But... Caring is, is not really, the scripture talks about the NIV says feeds and carries, but it's not deep enough for what this word is saying. The Hebrew word really means he feeds and nourishes her with the word of God and with his presence, but he cherishes her. You know, he doesn't just care for her like an orphan. He cares and cherishes her with like his own physical blood body. Now, Paul... He reveals how Jesus plans to bring his church to the radiant glory. And he says that um, we're divided, we're immoral, bitter, angry church. We'll be filled with glory. That in itself is the most miraculous thing that we could ever see. <laughs> is to see all the bitter and offended people be filled with the glory of God. Well, how is he going to do it? He brings her to radiance by cherishing her. So many people think that we're hypocrites, you know. We're just constantly declaring how great we are when we look like we're not great. All right, we'll give them that. It's true. But what we're really doing is what God said to Abraham. I'm the God that calls things that are not as though they are. God said, let there be light. And there was light from nothing became light. That's our God. He creates with his words, and we're his body. We create with our words. And so for children, you know, we nourish and we cherish our children, but do we speak life over them? And that's what speaking life means. We are literally cherishing them. Now, many men, they really have a hard time with this. You know, they, the, the being idea of God cherishing, embracing, and romancing them is just... It's just a taboo thing, man to man. They, they can't handle that. But it's not really a long-term problem because God is the one doing the embracing and he is so much stronger than any of us can resist, <laughs> including the men, especially the men. They will feel so overcome and empowered by that embrace of God, the feeling that God loves them, that it will be a passionate love back to God. And it will transform not only women but men. So this is not really a gender thing that we can relate to God more because we're women and this is a love language. No, 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 no. Not at all. God it takes the sexualness out of the imagery and pours pure and holy transforming love into men and women. And it's that cherishing embrace, you know, 
Have you ever been to church where the pastor's given an altar call and it was pretty harsh? You know, you knew you knew whoever was coming down there, they were in some deep sin, but they were on their knees, a man particularly I'm thinking of, and weeping and crying. And you see the pastor come over and put his arm around him and pat him and lead him through prayer. And when the man gets up, his face is shining. That's what I'm talking about. God, even more so than that, he brings us to this place of cleansing where we give up and that loving embrace of the cleansing of God washes us and we rise up clean and repentant and moving forward again. You know, that is our will submitted to the greater love of God. And finally, when you let go, you realize, why was I holding on to that darkness when I just could have easily given it away and received the light? Now, that is the transforming power of God that a lot of men experience. And just don't let go. It's uh, one of my very favorite things about God is that I always say he never, he never breaks the hug first, ever. You know, when you hug somebody, you get to that little uncomfortable point like, oh, hey, 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 you know, nice to see you. But what if you just never let go of your friend when they came through the door? <laughs> They'd start to feel like squirmy, like, hey, okay, that's enough. All right, love you too, sister. But God never lets go of the hug first. And if you want to be hugged, he will hug you and hug you and hug you and hug you. And he's like that. I just, I love that about our Lord. He cherishes every minute with us and of course he has all time all eternity he can wait us out it's usually us that break the hug and say okay that's all i can take right now lord he cherishes us now let's look at uh, these ways that he does how does jesus cherish us well first thing he does is he releases his affection to us that's one way he does it you know, we're filled with the radiance as the Holy Spirit teaches us and releases. We feel the affection of God towards us. He loves us. He thinks you're beautiful. He thinks you're great. Oh, my God, there's joy when you come together and everybody's happy in the Lord. You feel his affection. Number two, he cherishes us by inviting us to full partnership with him. You know, you, you might like old Aunt Lucy, but you sure don't want to live with her. <laughs> you know, well, Jesus wants to live with you. He invites you to be fully partnered with Him. He, and that is a cherishing you by allowing you to partner with Him in ministry. And it's a great honor. But He doesn't just invite the perfect people. He's invited a weak bride into full partnership with Him. It's just the most amazing thing that He would do that. It goes against all of our thought processes. You know, we, we start in kindergarten, we go all the way to 12th grade or passed into higher education, and they, they train us to be perfect. You know, if you do it right, if you do it 100%, you get the A, you get the trophy, you get the scholarship. You know, our whole lives are trained to be the best. And there's nothing that wrong with that. We're, we're teaching our children, you know, we're affirming them in having... Um, working hard and, and coming up with something that they deserve. And those who've worked hard do need to be congratulated for it. But at the same time, we've lost the understanding of God loves us even when we're weak. He also loves us when we're successful, but he loves us when we're weak too and helps us up. We forget that about the Lord and we, we get hard with each other. So number three, he cherishes us by affirming these character traits, these budding virtues, these parts of us that are just, they're not quite mature, like the fact that we are beautiful to God. Well, we might not really be. <laughs> you know, we might be full of pride, and that's not lovely. But he affirms the fact that he calls her what she's not to call her towards the beauty. He affirms her. And um, when we stumble, when we're weak, you know, and the enemy is so worn the church down. He, he's just accusations and condemnations. And, and we hurt each other because we're hurting, you know, hurt people hurt people. Uh, but the Lord doesn't do that. He cherishes us by affirming our willing spirit. You know, he esteems her longing for victory. She longs for victory. And he's like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. He doesn't define her by her external struggles. When we typically do, we define ourselves by our own spiritual struggles. You know, 
we might compare ourselves with Billy Graham or someone, and I'll never be that, I'll never live up to that, and, and we settle for less in our lives. And what we don't understand is Billy Graham struggled exactly the same way we do. He's just a man like everyone else. He gave himself to the Lord. He entered into mature bridal partnership. He stepped out in faith, and God gave him favor. But we don't understand that we all have these struggles, every one of us. And we need to understand that God longs for himself. He longs for us to not only see the negative in our lives, but to see the positive. You know, we, we get stuck by just seeing our negative. And let me explain it like this to women. So women, we look at our bodies, okay? Let's just say we look at our face. We look at our faces and we say, oh, I got a pimple here. I got an age mark here. I got a wrinkle here. But we don't say, look how beautiful your eyes are. Oh my gosh, your teeth are so straight. And we look at ourselves and we criticize and we pick ourselves apart rather than emphasizing what's beautiful because all of us have flaws. And I'm um, preaching to myself too, you know, we're all hypercritical. And we need to try to speak life over ourselves as well as those around us. So God does, he sees our sin, but he doesn't only see our negative struggles. So she's desired, okay, and um, she's desired to be dedicated to the Lord, right? So what does he call her in her undedicated season? He says, you're my dedicated one. He says to her, your lips are like honey and they drip like milk and honey. When actually she needed to have her tongue bridled. There wasn't a lot of honey dripping off her lips in that season. But he calls her things that she's not. I'm calling you forth to have your lips like honey, drip like milk and honey. I think that's one of the most miraculous things is that we can actually do that for each other and for your own children for your own children are you speaking life over your children you know let's look at another example let's look at Gideon Gideon was in Judges chapter 6 and here this man is he's hiding Israel is being attacked by the Midianites and he's hiding in the cave literally in the wine press just hiding in there and scared to death and full of fear and, and he's just hiding and running away and he's supposed to be a leader you know and this angel comes and he says almighty man of valor and he's sitting there thinking who me <laughs> you know who me and the lord saw gideon's strength but it wasn't yet operating in him his strength was down in there was a seed that the Lord had planted. And he called him a mighty man of valor. Not just a mighty man, but a valiant, valiant warrior of the Lord. And, and here he is afraid and hiding. And, but he did. He became one of the greatest leaders of Israel because God spoke it over him. This eternal God who has total insight and authority. You know, he looks at you and calls you a lover of God because... To him, you are a lover of God. He sees you in your future. But um, the religious community, now they define you by what they see outwardly. They define us by our, um, what they see us doing, what they see us not doing. They define us by our, our money, by our looks, by our clothes, by our cars, religious communities. They, they don't look we don't look at each other with the eyes of god with the eyes of the spirit and even when we do many times in the prophetic community we see something in somebody and we know that's where god's taking them and then we see that they're not there yet we get frustrated and angry with them and we start judging them you're supposed to be here but you're not there yet you know we're harsh on each other we we're we're even harsh on ourselves we're very hard on ourselves and that's not how we transform we learned last week we transform by beholding Him. And in the beholding of Him, we are transformed from glory to glory. And now we learn that He transforms us by pouring out this radiance on us, by cherishing us, by calling us what we are. Okay, let's look at one more example. Look at Peter. Peter. Jesus called him the rock, right? In Matthew 16 and 18. The Lord said, Peter, you are the rock. You're the unmovable one. But Peter was filled with fear. Peter denied the Lord three times. 
within one day. <laughs> he ran away. You know, he was not the rock. He was actually one who compromises a lot. So can you see how the Lord will take your weakness and then call you the opposite of your weakness? You know, what has God spoken to you about who you are lately? Maybe it's a hint that that's where he's taking you. Maybe he's actually saying, you know, I see your weakness, but I'm calling you this. You will be my rock. You won't be the one that compromises. You won't be unstable in all these ways. You will be the unmovable one, somebody that everyone else can count on. And Peter did become the first bishop of the Christian church. We all long to be cherished. Why? Why do we long to be cherished? Well, God designed us that way. He designed us to be a longing to be enjoyed and to be desired. It's not a sin to want to be enjoyed and to want to be desired. Each person longs to be cherished. He built us with the need to feel enjoyed and desired by God and then by other people. How do we know that? Because he gave us the first two greatest commandments. Remember commandment one, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And number two, to love your neighbor as yourself. These are things that are our deepest emotional needs and profound things that Christ put in us to draw us to himself and to each other. So there's nothing wrong with desiring to be cherished. Absolutely nothing wrong with it at all. I think where we get off is we stuff other things in we try to become cherished in other ways rather than being allowing God to cherish us. You know, um, for example, looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. So many people do that. When love is God, God is love and love is God. And mm -hmm. you think, well, that's not the kind of love I'm looking for. Well, you're going to find the kind of love you're looking for and then you're going to be beat up and condemned and feeling nasty and dirty when it's all said and done. And when you finally come back to the Lord in his simplicity and feel his affection for you, you realize, okay, you're right. That's not the kind of love I was looking for. <laughs> you think it is until you get it. And then it's like, oh man, I, it, you know, have you ever desired a chocolate milkshake so bad you thought you were going to go crazy? You finally got your chocolate milkshake and then you were stuffed and miserable. It's not going to fulfill the desire that you think it does, but God's love comes with no regret. His love never fails, we learn in 1 Corinthians. Amen. His love never fails. When the other loves do, his love doesn't fail. He's a glad king. All right, now let's see. If we have enough time, where are we on the time? I don't want to talk too long, but, you know, I'd hate to do this into three sessions. Let's try to jump in a little bit and do verse 5 first, just a little bit. All right, guys? So, here we are. Back to chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. Well, he said this all throughout the song. Fair, you are beautiful. He's crying over her. You are beautiful. You are beautiful to me. You are all fair, my love, my beautiful one. He's just trying with everything in him. God is to bring us up out of the muck and the mire. You are gorgeous. You are beautiful. He defines what beauty is. God defines what beauty is, not us. He defines it. And he says, we are lovely. Fair are you, even in your weakness. Well, why? Let's look at four reasons why we are beautiful to God. You know, a lot of people have to have reasons. I'm happy with God just telling me he loves me. But we have some intellectual types. <laughs> so I think we'll look at it in a minute. There's four reasons why we're beautiful to God. One is because the gift of righteousness through the finished work of the cross. It's one of the most dramatic declarations imaginable is God declaring that weak, broken people are beautiful by the fragrant garments of righteousness that are upon us. We are wrapped in righteousness, robes of righteousness because of his blood. That makes us beautiful. Not because of our works, but because of His. We are righteous because of the blood of Jesus, and it makes us beautiful to Him. 
You know, she says yes to him. Yes, there's a willing spirit. Number two, he's given us a willing spirit at our new birth. We're not kicking and screaming and no, ah, no, no, no. There's a yes in us. She answered her bridegroom and said yes. You know, when a young man finally gets enough courage to ask someone to marry him, he's still nervous, even if he knows her answer is going to be yes. But when he finally, you know, plans the day and he romances her the way he wants her romance and he knows she's going to say yes, but there's still that, oh my God, what if she says no? What if she says no? And he goes through all of this and he gets down on his knees and he, he proposes to her and then she finally, she hesitates. And he's like, <gasps> you know, you can just feel the tension in the air. And when she says yes, there's an exhilaration. And that's why God thinks you're beautiful. You exhilarate him with your yes in your spirit. And David, when he sinned in Psalm 51, what did he pray? He said, restore unto me a willing spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. salvation. He, that's what makes us beautiful to God. Okay, number three, the nature of God's personality makes us beautiful. In other words, he sees us. He is the one that defines what beauty is. I may think red's a beautiful color. You may think blue's a beautiful color, but God may think purple is a beautiful color. You see, he sees things from his point of view differently than other men do. Remember when he chose King David? They all had these brothers, big tall men, and they lined them all up, and Samuel came to anoint the new king of Israel with his horn of oil, and he looked around and was like, these, are these the only ones? And well, we've got this one little short redhead with ruddy face, red suntan out there keeping the sheep. You don't want him. Sure enough, that was the one God wanted, David, the man after God's own heart. He sees things differently. And I'm going to tell you, one of God's favorite looks is when you get up off the floor and your hair is all crazy like this and you eyes are red because you've been crying and belly laughing so hard in the anointing that's one of his favorite looks you know we get all pretty we want to go to church and if the holy spirit falls if you ever watch the pentecostal church when they're coming out of the church <laughs> they don't look the same as coming in as they do coming out but i'm gonna tell you the coming out look is more of god's style than the going in look <laughs> He loves it when we're honest and real and gut-wrenchingly emotional. He loves that about us. And if you aren't in a gut-wrenching emotional person, that's okay because God's going to do it and you're going to find out one day when you get under the anointing that he even puts introverted intellectuals on the floor and busses with their hair sometimes. <laughs> that's my favorite day in church. All right, now what's the fourth reason that we are beautiful to God? Her destiny before God as his son's future bride. We're beautiful to him because we're his son's fiance. That's why father thinks we're pretty. He's making us into the adorned, embraced, enthroned bride of Christ. That makes you beautiful because you're engaged to Jesus and he will make you beautiful so that his son has the perfect bride. Father God will not allow his son to show up on his wedding day with a dirty, spot-filled, sin-filled bride. It's not going to happen. We will be adorned and enthroned for Jesus. Oh, my love. Oh, all right. So the next phrase, let's see what is he says. Behold, you are fair, my love. Now, we're really digging here each phrase. My love. What does that really mean? It is the knowledge that we run to him instead of running from him. Now, I know that seems strange, but remember, a lover works harder than a worker any day. My love, he declares over us. You know, we're growing rapidly in the spirit. And the way we know this is if you run to God when you're in trouble instead of running from him. If you're not running to him, then you're not growing in the spirit. That is the result of being called my love as you run to the Lord. And Jesus emphasizes her beauty when he says, Behold, behold. When you see that word, it's like, Behold, the Holy Spirit is blasting this divine trumpet sound. Behold, you are beautiful, and you are my love, my fair one. It's, it's just the most fantastic way to break the discipline. <laughs> you know, if you've been sent to your room by your daddy and you're in trouble... 
you're not coming out with Jesus lecturing you again. You know, you were lectured before you were sent to your room and you're in trouble, but now he doesn't lecture you again. He declares, oh, you're so wonderful. He breaks the silence. You're so wonderful, beautiful, fair are you, my love. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. He is declaring over her, her beautiful eyes. Now let's look at this. The eyes, they refer to faith and revelation. But they also have spiritual understanding. Let's look. Ephesians 1.18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The eyes, the eyes, you know, action and obedience, it flows out of revelation. We can't obey if we don't have directions. How are we going to obey if we don't know what to do? So it's that revelation knowledge and understanding that our eyes are enlightened, our minds are enlightened with wisdom and knowledge, and we know what? We know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in us. We know that we're beautiful. God's making us into the bride. We're his inheritance. We are the riches of God for God. And we know that through the eyes, uh, dove's eyes, beautiful eyes, redemptive truths. Look at Isaiah 17, 7. It says, in that day, a man will look to his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Now, there's a few in here that talk about eyes, but let's look at particularly dove's eyes, okay? Dove's eyes, not just any eyes. Dove's eyes speak of that beautiful purity and innocence and the loyalty. She has the eyes of revelation that are the eyes of the Holy Spirit, not just any spirit. She's not a psychic, right? So many people get distracted. They'll call these 1-900 psychics. Well, they're getting the wrong revelation. They're getting some demonic spirit speaking through somebody or their own head knowledge and intuition. But dove's eyes is the Holy Spirit's eyes. Pure and innocent dove. The Holy Spirit is pictured this way as a pure and innocent dove. And he has these beautiful eyes. So he didn't call her a deceitful snake. Mm-mm. He endeared her with love, a dove, which is sincerity, innocence, and purity. Some of the other things about a dove is they never mate again when their partner dies. They're unique in their loyalty. The Holy Spirit is loyal to us, and he's calling her loyal to him. A dove uh, cannot focus on two things. It can only focus on one thing at a time. They actually don't have any peripheral vision. So he's saying you're single-minded. You know, instead of having one security one moment and condemnation the next, which we all seem to, you know, double-mindedness, going back and forth, back and forth in our thoughts, whether we're believing or not, whether we're happy or not. She, at this point, is, he is her source. She's single-minded towards the Lord. She's single-minded in her devotion to Jesus, and her eyes are fixed upon him. Her focus upon him instead of focusing on her, her lust or, or upon her failures or her successes. You know, that tosses us around back and forth. Am I a failure? Am I a success? It's a torment from the enemy. And when we can truly focus on his love for us in that single-minded way, all that fades away in his glance. It is a key, really, to walking in maturity that I personally am still working on. Uh, let's look at Matthew 6, another part about the eye. This is a, kind of an obscure scripture, too. Not many people know about this. Matthew 6, 21. The lamp, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's really quite hard to understand, but I think if we look at it with the lamp of the body is the eye, if our understanding, our revelation, our single-mindedness is good, then our whole being will be full of God, the light. Jesus is the light of the world. But if our eye is bad, if we're focused on the negative things, fear, anger, 
worry, pain, pride, lust, all the negative fruit of the Spirit, then our whole being will be full of this darkness. We're, we're constantly saturating ourselves with this, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Put the Word of God in, the Word of God comes out. And there's just this simple little principle that Paul teaches us that whatever you put in your mind, it's in Romans 8, whatever you put in your mind becomes part of who you are. And then Jesus t teaches us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let me look at Romans 8 real quick because it's a principle that everybody needs to know. There's some things that really are written in stone. It's like gravity. You can say you don't believe it all you want to, but gravity is an eternal law. <laughs> it may not be when we get into the second heaven, third heaven, I mean, but it is in the earthly realm. And this is one of those, what I call, an immutable law. Like Jesus said, with whatever measure you use, it will be measured unto you. It's like a law of heaven, um, a principle, maybe a better word. So in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. This is what Paul is teaching us. That if you put your mind on the things of the flesh, you will be full of the things of the flesh. It's quite simple. If you put your mind on the things of God, you will be full of the things of God. So here's the principle. Whatever goes in your mind gets down in your heart and comes out your mouth. Good or bad. It is a principle. Whatever you feast upon in your mind becomes part of who you are and it's going to come out your mouth. So you can judge yourself. What's coming out of your mouth? That's who you are. So the lamp of the body is the eye, all right? Our eye, our spiritual eye of revelation, knowledge, and understanding. As a prophetic person and a prophetic community, the eye often is called the windows of the soul by many people, but it's just, it's more than that. God leads us a lamp, you know, he, he leads us with our, with his eye, with his all seeing, all knowing eye. And what that I think really means is he leads us with revelation. He leads us with a revealing of a deeper meaning behind the word of God. He leads us with visions that we see inside ourselves and outside ourselves. He leads us with, through our eye in dreams. He, he shows us uh, demonic principalities and powers. He shows us angels. All these are ways of seeing in the Spirit by the Holy Spirit. That is your eye. And then He gives you not only wisdom to know what you've seen, but He gives you understanding about what you've seen. And He gives you knowledge about how to apply what you've seen through prayer or how to react or not react to it. And then he reveals to you the meaning of it, you know. I love the word revelation, that your eyes may be enlightened, that you may have a spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge, a spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge, that you understand it. This is part of having your eye enlightened by God. It's not particularly a mental task. It's actually using all of your functions in the spirit together, your you're focused mentally, you're focused emotionally, you're focused spiritually, and this is how you become full of light. It is meditating in the deep things of God and then reading the Word of God to get deeper understanding and meaning. <clears throat> so, now let's look at the next phrase, behind your veil. Behind your veil. All right, so she has purposely hidden all right? She's hiding. She's holding back aspects of her revelation behind her veil. Now, now let me let me go back a little bit and read the whole phrase because I've been teaching a long time. What did he say to her? <laughs> well, we've made it to verse 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. And I will talk about this one, I think, then we'll end for today. 
So here she is. She's hiding these beautiful eyes behind her veil, like I think of wedding veil in this case. She's holding back. She's covering herself, and it's an act of, of humility. It speaks of her humility before God. It speaks of her secret life before God, like Moses, when he went up onto the mount of God in the tent of meeting, when he came out, he had to veil his face because it shone so strong with the anointing of the glory of God that it frightened other people. Well, this is where she is. She is seeing and having these abundance of revelations, and she's humble. So she's like behind this veil in this secret life with God. So here's what Paul said about his life like that. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Here again we have Paul. Now he was a mature apostle at this time. He was seeing into the third heaven, seeing realms of places, and God forbid that we'd have so much pride that God would feel the need to send a messenger of Satan to buffet us, to cause our pride to be beat down. Oh Lord, Karabashi, have mercy on us, oh God. We do not want a messenger of Satan. I say go low and repent now and walk in humility in that secret place behind your veil where your strength is made perfect in that humility, in that weakness. You know, his grace is sufficient. How many times have you heard people teach this passage? And it's almost like they said, well, God said no. He's not taking that from you. He said no. It doesn't say that in my Bible. It says, God said to him, my grace is sufficient. All sufficient. My grace is enough to handle this. You're going to be okay. I'm not taking this devil away that's tormenting you. Now, some people think it was a person that walked around nah, 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 all the time. Some people think it was an actual devil that followed him around to cause him to feel, you know, less proud, I suppose. I don't know. Maybe it was a temptation that he constantly had that he had to resist all the time. But think of what the word buffet means. What does the word buffet mean? Mm. To buffet him. Yes, to smack him around. The word buffet. I don't know. I've not used that word very often. Buffet. To smack him around. Satan to buffet him. Oh, Lord, please don't let us have to walk like Paul. Let us be like the Shulamite behind the veil. But Paul had a tendency to exalt himself, even though he was a mature apostle. You know, God love him. We love him. He was a bold preacher, and I'm thrilled because we learned so much from the Apostle Paul. He's one of my favorites. I like them all. <laughs> all right, so this verse speaks of faith and revelation, and she's covered with humility and purity and loyalty towards God, and she's single-minded in His grace. This is just such a beautiful picture. I'm sorry we just made it to chapter 1. I mean, a verse 1 of chapter 4, but it's so rich. It's so rich. So remember this week, when you're learning about who you are in Christ, to not beat yourself up. Allow the Lord to cherish you. Allow Him to see you as full of humility and purity and loyalty towards God. Allow God to speak over you. My love, my dove, my fair one, how beautiful are you behind your veil. Allow it to go deep into who you are. And Father, I just pray for us that this teaching from the Song of Solomon, Lord, would just go deep within each one of our spirits, our souls, and our body, that it will become part of who we are, that we can truly be women and men of maturity, to walk in your anointing in great power, to have an assurity of who we are in you in great humility. Father, that we know that we are cherished and so we can cherish others that we would truly be your vessels in the earth. And like I pray, Lord, let me be the glove on your hand, that as your hand moves around the earth, I just follow you so closely that I'm like a glove on your hand, Father. And I just pray that we all will enter into this beauty, the beauty realm that you've called us to. And I pray that, and I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today.